I think part of it is a paradigm shift in how we're transferring our hunting and fishing passions from one generation to the other. You never know yeah. what's going to happen. The mystery, the mystery rules the place. And so when I look at when I look at where BHA is, I'm one of those people for whom access to wild places changed everything about my life. Maybe I'm going to deer hunt or turkey hunt on state game lands. You know, my thought process was, I'm, this is state land. That's behind me now, Hal. How so? This is my land. Hello, this is uh, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers Podcast and Blast. I'm Hal Herring. I'm in Boise, Idaho with uh, Eddie Nickens. You might know him as T. Edward Nickens. He's a writer for Field Stream, Audubon, pretty much everybody else, the author of the Total Outdoorsman books. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Been a good um, time. Yeah. So I'm, uh, I've been waiting to meet Eddie for years and years uh, since I first read a piece he wrote with a buddy of mine in Bugle Magazine, Rocky Mountain Elf Foundation Magazine. Uh, you know, 15 to 18 years ago. I don't even want to think about it. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for bringing that up. I was yeah. having a good time so far. It would make you feel super <laughs> annuated. <laughs> but yeah, I, uh, I had followed it, you know, from that. Uh, and um, I, I'm super proud to meet you. I just missed you over in eastern Montana on a sharp tail hunt. Yeah. yeah. Um, but so, uh, and, and coincidentally, as, as coming from Raleigh, North Carolina, and I'm originally from Alabama, um, you are working with BLA on, uh, BHA on the board, right? Yeah. So I'm on the national board. I guess this is my second year into the term. Uh, and then been working pretty hard here over the last six months or so to get a North Carolina chapter cranked up, which we got voted in a existence this weekend. And we are super stoked about super, that. Super officially stoked. Officially. Yeah. 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 I think it was, uh. No, I don't think. I know it was the first all caps text message I've ever sent out uh-huh. from the uh, from the board meeting to my to my crowd of North Kakalakians. And what did it say? It said, "We are in." Gotcha, man. <laughs> cool, cool. Well, it's uh, um. I mean, we were talking about this earlier. You're you're a natural fit, and it, but North Carolina is a natural fit, and you're a natural per- person to be leading that. But it, uh, I mean, I, I've read your stuff in Garden and Gun, um. And it's just a, it's a celebration of the outdoors in the deepest way. I, I, I can't say enough about without going too far. Well, that's awful. Uh, that's awful kind. There's, yeah. there's days when I wish somebody would go a little far with some of that. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you could use the boost. Yeah. I'll give you a shout sometime <laughs> there. Hal. Yeah. But, uh, I, I had, uh, you know, I've, I've followed your work and I could see, you, I didn't, I didn't know you were coming in with BHA and I'm just super glad that's, that's worked out. And I wanted to talk about like what, what BHA in North Carolina will do. Um, who comes to BHA in North Carolina? What do y'all do? Uh, I understand the state because I lived on the Outer Banks some as a young man. There you go. Um, and, uh, so I, and I, so I understand the fit, but who's coming? You know, what's been interesting to see is the the breadth of the people that have come to these pint nights, you know, and we're tapping into that sort of youthful vigor, you know, that get after it aspect that, that BHA has, but you are also in a high tech area there in, in North Carolina. We've got some, some folks who are, who, who, who think about things in a real programmatic way. So I'm, I'm glad we've got both of those types in on this, but I mean, you're right. I mean, North Carolina, it, I mean, it is a natural fit. I mean, yeah. Th- People think about, you know, it's an eastern state, it's a southern state, but we got 2 million acres of national forest. We got yeah. 2 million acres of estuarine waters, you yeah. know, Pamlico Sound, Al- Albemarle Sound, Core, Croatan. These are, these, are, these are public waters that people go out in their canoes and their kayaks and their flat skiffs, and, and these, are, these are public lands as well. Yeah, and so gotcha. It's like this sort of western state, you know, I mean, I live in Raleigh, right, so I... I take a left out of Raleigh, and in three and a half hours, I'm on the highest mountain east of the Mississippi, right. Mount Mitchell, right? Yeah. You know, in the middle of Nantahala, Pisgah National Forest, yeah. best trout fishing you're going to have, grouse hunting, deer hunting, bear hunting. I take a take a right-hand turn out of Raleigh, and two and a half hours, I'm, I'm sitting there on Cape Lookout National Seashore, Cape Hatteras National Seashore. Yeah. You know, these are, some of these beaches are 
50 miles long and there's not a t-shirt shack there's not a boardwalk there's not right. a nothing but wild dune you know right. and so even in north carolina we kind of we sort of grow up with a sense of uh, birthright okay I bet. yeah we, this 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 sense of on the weekends what do we do we go hike we go we go paddle we go backpack right you know, we go surf fish you know we go cast for redfish and so yeah it's a natural fit yeah. um uh, but I think it kind of works works both ways, you know. I mean, we and I and I sort of talk about this on the board. And I think one of the reasons they that, that I was asked to come on the board is certainly my relationship with Field and Stream and Garden Gun and some of these other these other magazines. But understanding what what backcountry means, uh-huh. and you know, your your backcountry how might not be my backcountry, right. right? And and helping folks understand that it's not a matter of. It's not a matter of how many paddle strokes it takes to get there. It's not a matter of how many footsteps down the trail it takes you to, to get there. Yeah. What, what matters is what the there is that is yours and that what you take from that. And that is, this is so meaningful and so powerful to me that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to protect it. Yeah. And so, you know, backcountry, frankly, in North Carolina could be, you know, the, 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 the marsh, 300 yards from the from the boat ramp you know right. where you're gonna you know, where you're gonna fly cast a redfish or it can be miles in right. uh, up in the mountains or, or anywhere in between but I, is, I, is madame mesquite there madame mesquite lake madame mesquite you know is the is the, the greatest goose hunting destination right. on the atlantic for right. years and years, and years i've hunted there many times i've hunted i've hunted there only on public lands, you know, mm-hmm. where it's like you show up and you've you've pulled your permit. They're going to give you your blind number at four thirty in the morning, and you and your ten thousand pounds of decoys are going to hump it over, you know, ten thousand slogging steps and nothing. And you might kill some ducks. Yeah, you might kill a lot of ducks, but every duck you put on the ground, you you earned it. Mm-hmm. You know, nobody mm-hmm. gave you that. Yeah. There's not a bunch of food plots and nothing, nothing against that. Right. Sure. There's a, there's a difference. You yeah. Know? And I, you know, we, we grew up as a fairly wealthy state Yeah, you know, and there's a lot of opportunity to buy your way into a super awesome Instagram post yeah, with, a big, with a big pile of <laughs> green heads and yeah. gadwalls and that's all, that's all good. And I've done it, but yeah. you know, there's a difference. There's a difference in shooting a duck. I'm not, you know, there's a there's a difference, man. There's a difference when you pull your truck off the side of the road and you got to haul your boat out of the back, throw your decoys on your back, drag this thing, push this thing, haul it over the beaver dams, find you a little place that nobody else knows about where you might shoot a couple of ducks. Yeah. And I'm not, I wouldn't trade, when it works, I wouldn't trade that feeling for anything. Yeah. And when it doesn't work, and I'm looking at my Instagram feed. I'm right. thinking, well, I, don't know. I guess there is another way to do it. Boy, I wish I had some lease money. <laughs> some lease money would sure go good right now. Uh-huh. Uh, Yo, you, you do a lot of small stream uh, duck hunting, don't you? Yeah, I do. That's, like to... I read your piece on that. It's yeah. awesome. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm fortunate for work. For work, I get to hunt. You know, all yeah. over, all over the country. But um, I love a canoe and a paddle and a little creek. Uh and I love a I love a beaver swamp like nobody on this planet. Yeah. Um, and we have a lot of that. And it's it's just my son Jack. He tells me, man. He said, Daddy, one day he said, if I can fall in love with duck hunting in North Carolina, <laughs> he yeah. said, I can fall in love with duck hunting anywhere. Right. Um. So we do have to scrap after some of it. Yeah. But a lot of it, Hal, is just right there. I mean, yeah. the trout fishing the is fabulous in the yeah. mountains you know i love to squirrel hunt and i do love to deer hunt you know I'm not a big horn guy i right. like i like you know if, if if you could cross a i always say if you could cross a deer with one of those little i don't even know how to pronounce it little dots and dogs little yeah. hot dog dogs you know, right right maximum back strap yeah. right <laughs> yeah yeah make them real long it, it long that's my yeah. boon, my boon and crockett would be how many inches long and how many inches so Gotcha. I do love to yeah. deer hunt, but I like to shoot two deer so I can start getting after the other stuff. Uh huh. Yeah. Get the free, get some meat in the freezer. Yeah, yeah. 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 I know y'all got uh, y'all. Got, I've I've been up in Shining Rock 
fishing uh, those tiny brook trout on black ants. That's yeah. the first place I ever learned to do that. And I had yeah. a real small fly rod, and um, it's it, the fish are small, but it was, it's a trophy fishery in a way. It's a trophy fishery because just brown native as the day yeah. is long. They buddy. were they were the ones left behind when the when the glaciers quit dragging their fingers across the ground right. twelve thousand years ago. So right. there there is something special about those brook trout. Um, Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Yeah. <laughs> without a doubt. But I'm also going to say there's something pretty special about a you know 22 inch brown coming yeah. out of a, out of a, a tailwater stream too. You yeah. bet. I, I can't remember the numbers, but we have like 400 miles of trout stream in yeah. North Carolina. It's a it's a wonderful place to. It's a it's just a mashup of everything. Yeah. You know, mountains, coast, Piedmont, and uh, I'm lucky to be there. I'm lucky to live there. I'm lucky to write from there. You know, there was a time when I, in my life, where I thought I was unlucky to write from there uh -huh. and unlucky to hunt and fish from there, but I've I've come around to it for sure. Yeah, yeah. I can, yeah. I definitely see why. I lived out there on the banks. I I actually hitchhiked to the banks when I was seventeen to catch the fall like blues, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and took the ferry to Ocracoke. Yeah, and uh, I ended up hooking up with people. I had some four wheel drives. Some old country boys that uh, were super friendly, and they rode me out there for every tide, and we had a blast. They were meat fishermen. Yeah, and I would I I paid for my transport by get by get. I didn't have a place to put the fish. Yeah, uh, but we got that. We got that fall blue yeah. run. Yeah, and there's and that's still there on the outer banks. You know, the northern outer banks have been you know sort of wall to wall McMansioned up. But yeah, the southern outer banks where I hang out a fair bit, Cape Lookout, man, I'm telling you, it's. I and mean, that's what Eric Durant saw when he came over and John Smith. You yeah, know, there's there's places out there, and that's one of the wonderful things. That's one of the one one of the wonderful things I like about a paddle, because I can be places where I can look up into thousand year old cypress trees, and yeah. I I know those trees had Carolina parakeets in them. Yeah, right. I know right. I know right. there might have been passenger pigeons in those. In wow, those, those what old a cool idea oh, that is, man. man. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's all still there. Yeah. And the mighty ocean is still there and running, running the show. No right. matter what, no matter what the the wall to wall mansion people are thinking. That's um, right. I That's mean, right. I, I remember there's a. Uh, I did a story out there in '04, I think it was, and um, the same families, the balances especially out there on Hatteras, yeah, had been there since the very first deeds were recorded. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I got a, a small little place in Moorhead's. Moorhead City, yep. and I spent a fair bit of time down in that way, you know, right there in the middle of the you know, greatest fly fishing for false albacore you know, you're going to yeah, have. I don't Parker's know about Island. that. Well, yeah. man, we'll, talk, we'll talk later. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I interviewed uh, the last man who was born on those banks uh, mm -hmm. before the storms in 1899 moved those communities. And, and that's, a, that's, that's a great lesson in that, that we look at those outer banks, Hatters, Cape Lookout, Shackleford Banks, is, this is a wild primeval country but you know 100 years ago there are 3,000 people living right. out living out over there have you been you've been out to Portsmouth oh yeah I've been spent, that... spent some spent a fair bit of time in Portsmouth um spent a fair bit of time looking for the old cemeteries yeah on, on the banks I mean you know you're you're crossing those those barrier islands and walking through that wonderful maritime forest with the live oaks and the dappled sunlight and your feet yeah. your feet start to kind of give you know your ankles get kind of squishy and you realize you look down and you realize i'm in one of these old cemeteries right you know right. and they're and the headstones are just you know just old rotted pieces of cedar and maybe there's a little bit there but you've got that it's that same feeling you know when you walk through a when you walk through a second grove forest that used to be a farm field you got you still got the corrugations right, of the, you, you know yeah. you, you, you get that well, where i grew up everything was terraced exactly right? and, yeah. and so you're in the terraces but you're in the forest right right and so i think i, I love that feeling of of re, of rewilded yeah you know, absolutely yeah yeah i will i often when i've i've camped on portsmouth um i wondered how they made it with the bugs well, in, in there in that day, where you think the bugs were just as bad as they are now, and then people, how did they do that? I don't think that the bug. I think we've got different mosquitoes. I think different. It's different levels. I think so, but I, you know, I think there's a different level of of whininess. You know, even we think we're tough, right? right we read. Right. Yeah, you know, I mean, you you love history. We read these 
history books, and we ain't tough. Right. On our toughest days, you right. know. I mean, they used to they used to burn a different level of whining. Yeah. This is probably what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they used to burn the cow dung, you know, right, yeah. right, you know, up upwind, so the, the 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 wind would drift and drive those. But Portsmouth, you bring up Portsmouth. Uh, I mean, I've I have paddled in Labrador. I mean, I've been through Ontario, Alaska, all the bad bug places, baby. Mm. You, you get on down to Portsmouth. Yeah, Portsmouth Beach. You let you let yeah. that wind lie down, and you're on that Portsmouth salt marsh, and that yep. tide's gone out, and yep. you're gonna get what they it's say coming. down there et up, et, et up, and then yellow flies at midday. Yeah, you know. Uh, um, I just remember the wind laying down in there. We were in the woods in Portsmouth, looking around at the settlement. And the wind laid down, and you could hear the whine rise. And it Coming was, out of the marsh. Yep. Yeah, and yeah. it was a matter of minutes after that before you were <laughs> stepping and fetching yeah. and running for the beach. Yeah. Um, but what's so wonderful about that area is however long it was when you were there, it's still there. Yeah. Mean, it's, a, it's a national seashore, you know, and, and it's one of those units of, the, of federal ownership where there's still all the, all the fishing, the yeah. hunting yeah. is still there. Um, yeah, you can go out one of the few places, I think, in the south. I mean, there's naturally, well, there's wild reproducing pheasant populations. Yep. Yeah, so you can go out on those outer banks and shoot pheasants. Right. I love going down there and seeing those old boys with their beagle packs in their in their 16-foot john boats wow. going over to some little bear island to run mm-hmm. those marsh rabbits. Yeah, uh, on, yeah. You know, and, and you're literally, you know, you're hearing the sound of the ocean crash, you know, as, right. you're, as you're running beagles. Right. It's, it's super cool. Yeah, there's a juxtaposition for you. <laughs> yeah. And you can be fishing. You can catch croaker and, and all that stuff, like, right after your beagle hunt. Oh, yeah. Kill them. yeah. I mean, slide them. Yeah. Like the, the fishing we did that one trip on Portsmouth um, was on some kind of surge. It was a storm somewhere else. Okay, yeah. yeah. And we, we just really killed them. Yeah. I mean, it was a, it was flounder. We we run flounder rigs. There were blues. This was before the stripers came back. Right, right. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, you never knew what was coming out of there next. Yeah, I mean, it's such a rich. And, I mean, it still is. But, I mean, now there's all the new threats. You know, yeah. I mean, we talk about offshore oil drilling, right? That's right. the big thing. And, and one of the... One of the visuals that I try to to help people think through is, you know, we're talking about everything sort of beyond the horizon. We're not going to see it. It's okay. It's out. But, you know, you think about the the infrastructure that's required. You know, we've kicked around. You and I have kicked around Louisiana. You know, we Lots. see the helicopters just buzzing, constant buzzing back and forth. Right. Everything going out of those oil derricks from pipe to toilet paper to lunch has got to be ferried back and forth. Those right. people. So, so the infrastructure that's going to be required on the coast in the Atlantic to service this oil and gas that people don't understand. I'm less concerned about the derricks yeah. and all of that than the enormous impact it's going to have. It will, it will absolutely devastate an economy that is thriving right now right. because people like to go and it's, and it's still wild. You bet. And that, I mean, that national seashore got to be one of the best ideas that anybody ever came up with, given the fact when you, when you look at the overdevelopment, that's what it is. Yeah. The overdevelopment to the north of it. And then you just, then you come back and there's a, I remember one time I was down there and there was a seal had come up. It was winter. Yeah. It was yeah. Just, you never know yeah. what's going to happen. The mystery, the mystery rules the place yeah. Yeah. because it's, because it's been set aside to allow it to be. But that was not a that was not a painless process. I Al. bet it would, you know. And so I've done some reading and some writing on those communities that were there, and and this was just those seashores, the Hatteras, and, and certainly Cape Lookout. This was just in the '60s and the early '70s, yeah. and those wounds are still raw for for yeah. every good reason. Because I mean, those people were were forced off that land. Right. You, you, it, it reminds me of the Great Smokies, you know, in yeah, the yeah. East, you know, that's just held as the paragon of wilderness right. and wild. And if, we, if we're just smart enough and set aside places um, to, to preserve them, but we set aside, we, we gained the Great Smokies at great human cost. Sure. All of those communities that were living there. I spoke to a lady one time when the, when the trucks came from the sheriff's department and literally they pulled her mother's hands from the railing at Catalucci Valley yeah, finger I, 
by finger. Yeah. And so we go to these places and we think wild, wild, wild. But a lot of times we don't realize the human, the human, what we've been willing to pay for conservation in the past. Right. And when you compare that to how society at large, how stingy we are now, right? Mm-hmm. A half a cent on, a, on this and right. how stingy we are now compared to how much our ancestors paid for us to enjoy the public lands that we have right now. Right. It's, it's something we need to, it's, it, it's shameful. It's yep. shameful that we're not willing to do. To well, it, it's, we, we are in peril of becoming those beneficiaries who, who, who have no concept of how we got, we got, we got in scorn, like, or take for granted without ever understanding the blood Right, that was shed to get it, and right. the sweat and the toil and the uh, I know, and I know, uh, I can't remember. This was told to me in person, so it must have been somebody. It was, it was not from. Uh, it was cattle. We were at Catalucci, but those daffodils are all still in there, right? You remember yes. that? You know yes. what they say oh, about yeah. that, right? Yeah, that's where the homesteads were, right? You know, and you they could... say they ain't got rid of us yet <laughs> when those things bloom in the spring. Uh, I have not heard that, but yeah. I can, I can hear. Those old settlers' families saying it, you know. Yeah. So by the by, their blood and loss, we 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 have some of those yeah. places. There's so, some of the same um, folks around Big Bend mm-hmm. and um, in Marathon, Texas, and I know I'm not pronouncing that the way they do, but uh, who will say the same? All right. And Big Bend is so spectacular, and and it looks so lean and austere. You would think nobody would, you know, we wasn't nobody there, but right. there was. Yeah. So there's a lesson for us, you know. Yeah. What are, what are we willing to pay figuratively, metaphorically, right. for for what we're fighting for, right. um, and we may never have to ask anybody to pay that kind of price. No, again. I don't. I don't think so. But we're I not. Mean, we're not. We're not willing to pay. You know, tiny pennies on the dollar. Right. Um, but what's what's been exciting about backcountry hunters and anglers is I, I see our currency is vigor and energy right. and passion and frankly a sense of pissed offness. Yeah, and and we are finding a way to channel that into into action. Where frankly, yeah. in, in years past, we channeled we just channeled that to the sky. It just sort of ate up our anguish at not being able to get anything done right. for the things that we for the things that we love. And 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 so BHA for me personally has has been uh, that 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 anvil in which my my energy and and it's all sort of been put into a new kind of shape. Right. And, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be on the national board. I'm super excited about what's happening in North Carolina, what's happening. We were in the board meetings yesterday and today, and to see the map, not that it's all about the numbers, and, but to see that map get colored yep. in. Yep. And not, not because we want it to be all colored in for any other reason than to know that, that just, that's just a testament to the people who are, who are signing on to the message. Yeah. It is. How many people... Um, I don't know how many people have asked me like like what what is the what is the attraction BHA has for youthful people and and I asked this question this morning to some other guys from the east. Um, would you do you know what that is? Is it? I mean, the graying of the conservation movement. Audubon has written about it. You, you know all this stuff, and it's a real thing. You yeah. Know? But here we have now a, a rooms filled. With like, with like, uh, athletically inclined or not, but mostly athletically inclined young people, deeply engaged in in I wouldn't I wouldn't even call it conservation. Right. I would say deeply engaged in in, in paying attention, yeah, to what they love. Yeah. What, what's bringing it? I think I think part of it is a is a paradigm shift in how we're transferring our hunting and fishing passions from one generation to the other. Okay, so okay. so. F- for all of our lives, you know, for the life of our country, for, you know, for the life of, of, of sporting, hunting and fishing, it's been family to die, you know, parent, uncle, yeah, brother, grandfather, to, to son. Yeah. Yeah. So there's been this traditional, and for so many of us, and, and I'm, and we can talk about this because I'm definitely one of these people who I did not enter into this, my, my love of hunting and fishing and wilderness through that traditional means. You know, I didn't, I did not have that pathway and so we're what we're 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 seeing a younger generation here's here's a great example my hunt club in north carolina so there's maybe 
30 of us, Stillwater Hunt Club, Eastern North Carolina, I got 4,000 acres, right? Um, kind of a real common thing in that part of the world. And traditionally, you know, it's, it's parents and their kids and whatnot, that, that they've, they've grown up hunting and fishing. But, but my son and some of his buddies, uh, no, no, my son Jack and my daughter, they, they grew up in this world. Um, but he had some friends, and I've talked to their dads about this. Their, their boys wanted to hunt. And these dads could have care less. They had no idea about hunting. The idea of hunting and shooting had never crossed their minds. The fathers. Their fathers yeah. had never crossed their minds until their boys started begging them, Daddy, please, let's go, let's go, let's go. And so they joined this club. So now what, what we're seeing is a 180-degree turn. Now these younger generations, they're reaching up, Hal, yeah. into the older generations. They're pulling them down into these traditions. And I, and I think it's a powerful powerful moment um and we can we can we can think about what caused this you know television i think was a, was good you know i mean there's, there's, as much as there is to say about outdoor television right. one thing that we can say is it it's it's brought this to the table it's it's made this something that people want to be involved in yeah um and you've done a bunch of that and i would like to talk about that later sure i mean uh, sure i mean you've been working tv as an outdoor writer and, a, and an involved and an outdoorsman. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so maybe that is it. Like I, I have a, I, I have no opinion on this. I don't know. Right. Where I, it comes from. I want to know. Yeah. I, I want to know. Yeah. So I, I think we do need to be careful as a, as this movement sort of grows with BHA. Um, we want to be aspirational, right? But we don't want, we don't want to be the, the place where you got to be, super fit and right. look, and look pissed off every time you pull on your parka to, right. to enjoy this you know this, right. there there are a lot of us who enjoy th- engaging in the outdoors in that kind of gritty manner right and 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 I love and I love that too but we certainly want the door open to people who appreciate our message and love public lands look there's 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 not a thing wrong with drowning a cricket in a public lands creek. No, I did all the time sit, myself. And yep. sitting on your five gallon bucket. You right? bet, man. And and we've got to we've got to be careful. I think that we that we are not seen as uh, the extreme athletes, and that that to be a part of us, you gotta gotcha. You gotta get after it. Uh, you know, at three o'clock in the morning, um, right? In a, in a blizzard. Yeah, 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 yeah. We talked to some out there this morning about um. Uh, there was a return to generalist. I love that. That's, a, that's too, old squirrel man. hunter, you know? Yeah. And a cricket drowner. Like, yeah. um, I mean, my, you know, my, my big thing about, uh, I live in Montana and I, we, we, when my kids were little, what we just, we just run crawlers in the big Missouri at the confluences because that's where you caught lots and lots of fish and there many of which could go in a frying pan, you know, there you go. Um, but, uh, in Alabama, you know, crop to me, crappie fishing under a bobber is the height of, it's, it's one of the greatest days that I can imagine. Yeah. And, yeah. um, I don't know that there's nothing extreme about it. there. Certainly is quite a lot of skill involved in, in doing it right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, uh, that was, that was, we would never want to exclude, I mean, that's what we're looking for. Right. You know, that's what, that's a, which it's a, it's a bigger, it's a big tent. It's, it is a, it is a big tent, and, but I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, that, that aspirational aspect is, a, it's a part of what we do. Sure. You know, and th- that's a part of what backcountry really means. Right, let's, let's go back to that sort of Eastern perspective, right? Okay. I mean, I've got to be honest, you know, when I'm shooting, when I'm hunting squirrels, when I'm stalking whatever, I mean, there's moments when I'm thinking, I want to be that that elk guy, you know. Yeah. I mean, what I want to do more than anything is that moose hunt, you know. So we yeah. that aspirational nature of our pursuits is is critical to our DNA. Yeah. Um, and so and that's what I tell folks in the East, you know, some of the issues in the West maybe we have a little bit harder time because we don't have direct skin in the game. Yeah. But but we do have that aspirational skin in the game. You know, yeah. we we want I mean we we've been a nation of strivers. Yep. And 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 grasp beyond our reachers. And we yeah. still need to be that way. Yeah. And so we 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 in the East and in the South 
what happens out here matters for two reasons. It happens out here being in the West. Yeah. It matters because it's coming. These ideas, these philosophies, these thoughts, these threats are coming, but they also matter because it might big aspirational hunts, big game, big country, big mountains matter because we're all drawn. We're all drawn. Well, and, and also, it's a big aspect of America writ large. It is. I mean, I, I, I don't know how many times we talked about, like, people who you can wake up, and I'm, I'm one of them, wake up in Gurley, Alabama one morning, and it's real hot or something, and you say, you know what, I'd really like to be somewhere else at this moment. <laughs> it's not that It's not that I'm just I'm, yeah. I'm wore out with where I'm at. Yeah. And in, in four days, you can be in the Cascades. You can be in the Rocky Mountains, and you're still in your own hard-fought, gloved country, right? right? And you can walk for the – hell, you can walk the rest of the summer. Yeah. You can freeze to death if you want. Yeah. And, you know, here's another thing that I think has changed in terms of how, we, how we're viewing – land and and back country. And I'm going to speak personally. I mean, as, as little as five or six or seven years ago, if I was going to trout fish right in North Carolina and I was going to access some stream, I, my, my thought process was this is Pisgah national forest land. This is, this is U S forest service land, or maybe I'm going to deer hunt or turkey hunt on state game lands. You know, my thought process was, I'm, this is state land. That's behind me now. How, how so? This is my land. Yeah. I've never, I truly have never had that kind of perspective. Mm-hmm. I mean, I knew it intuitively, mm-hmm. but, but now when I go to the Forest Service track, this is my land yep. that I have entrusted the federal government to manage and make available for me yep. at the highest bishop. When I yep. go on state land, that is, that is my land. Those are my beaches. They're your beaches yep. and your beaches and your beaches and your beaches, but those are not some agency's property never that, have that, been. They, that they are allowing us. Yeah, never have been. That. Never, never have been, but I think that's an important mental shift. It is. And I think that's what's fueling a lot of what we're seeing east, west, north, south is – it's not a hashtag line, as you know how. Right. It is this. It is our land. Yep. And if and if we don't take care of it, you know, we've see, we we seeded that over the generations. Y'all, you know, far y'all got to take care of it. You know, you know, right. If we don't take care of it, this this gonna it's gonna be gone. Right. And it, and the movement, as far as the privatization of public land movement goes, um, <laughs> if anybody has any. Any idea of consequence extrapolation, right? The logical logical progression. Yep. Well, I mean, good lord, if they, if you want to sell off the BLM land or in Nevada or in eastern Montana, imagine what the buyers would line up to get the Nantahala. Oh yeah. Can right? you? Yeah. And we've and frankly we've seen some you know, some big tech money come in and swallow up some big monstrous tracks. We we we've, 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 we haven't seen that uh, like like it's been in the West, but there there are a couple of examples of people, sure. and you know they're doing wonderful things, restoring land. This is happening in the coastal plain and in the mountains. Uh-huh. You know, multiple thousands, tens of thousands of acres. You know, that's just something that you don't. See. They're doing great things, but they're but they're putting up signs. Sure, you know, and so right. they're if. And that's that's a struggle. That's no, going to be an increasing struggle. It is for sure. And uh, and from a biodiversity aspect, I applaud them. Absolutely. Um, and and uh, but from a a societal future future, uh, you you have to be concerned because one. I mean, we don't have access to it. It can be as beautiful as you want. It can be as perfectly pristine as you want, but you can't go there. Right. And I spent a lot of time with Jim Posowitz um, mm-hmm. yep. when I was younger and, uh, and not much younger, like the last 10 years. And uh, Jim used to have, say, you know, well, if you, could, if you cut off the American people from their birthright of their land, the one of the most dangerous things you get is they no longer know what's out there. They don't know what their birthright is. They don't is. know what it is. And yeah. and so access had to be a component of most of what Paz would say, with all its dangers and like, you know, smashing the six pack and shooting the snapping turtle and all that stuff. There were things you had to endure 
and to try to guide people. But they had to have access to the birthright. Exactly. Otherwise, over a course of two or three generations, they don't know what it is. They're cut off from it, and they soon will be divested of it. Exactly. You, I mean, you don't know. It was like a fool in his money. Exactly. Right. All right. All right. So I'm. Uh, I mean, I'm with you, and I. I just. Uh, I, I'm. I'm all for private lands, and I'm all for public lands at the same time. There, this. You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've got. We got enough to fight over. We got yeah. 640 million acres. Right. Okay. We can, we can, that's our battleground, yeah, right? Yeah. And so that's the, that's the push pull of this American experiment, it right? Is. You know, I mean, we, we applaud achievement and achievement is often sort of judged by accumulation. And right. so, but at the, but at the same time, we applaud a lot of contradictory things. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. I think that one of the beauties, I think one of the, be- the the actual dynamism of the United States of America is the contradictory notions operating kind of like two, two turns of a magnet where you build the electricity. Yep. And, yep. Um, and it's always beautiful. been that way. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, I, I think we, we're going to be faced that I think the essence of what me and you are talking about right here is that it's our land managed and we trust the federal government to manage it. And we, we, we then don't trust them very much. We ask, we demand very various things for our land. And then we come to compromise on what those are because the anti, and there is an anti-public lands movement and there is a privatization movement and they would love nothing more than for all of us to say, well, we're all locked out of our national forest. That's what it is. The right. feds own it. And I hear this from the Bundy crowd every time. And my eyes have now glazed over. I can't, I can no longer confront them with it because of their, their power of absolute certitude. Absolutely. All, yeah. Often wrong, usually wrong, but never in doubt. Right. And never know? backing down. Never one, backing one, down. One, you, one inch. Facts yeah. mean nothing. Right. Um, it, and uh, so that, and, and there seems to be one of the, I think one of the goals that BHA could do, which would be a very pint night kind of coffee drinking, handshaking thing, is to simply present the idea that, that the, the true idea that it's your land. It is your land. And that was, and, and for someone like me, whose entire career has been based on access to these kinds of places, if, if I had blinders on, right? Right. And I'll admit that I oh, did. I know, if, me, I I, if I had blinders on, and I just, I remember that moment of riding through the, we were on the Pisgah, the Pisgah National Forest, and, and seeing the sign. And, it was a, a revelation to me that it was the first time that I thought what's behind that sign is mine, right. not whose name is on that sign. Yeah. You know, they've signed the lease with me. Right. Right. You bet. It's yeah. An agreement. Yeah. And yeah. I've got, and so that's what BHA is right. kind of looking at this. You know, you've, you've signed the lease with the American public and we need to control some more of those terms. Right. That's kind of where we are you bet. with this. And yeah. so. I remember going to sh- uh, to uh, Looking Glass up at Brevard, North Carolina, yep, yep. and we would make a mass exodus out of Tuscaloosa and go pack up the climbing gear. And our climbing gear was pretty crude. It was also it was all that Chenard, early Chenard <laughs> climbing gear, and um, it, it was kind of a, a flabbergasting idea that you could just walk up there and spend the night and then go rock climbing on this huge, uh, incredible sandstone. And nobody was coming and messing with you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we've got to, you know, we've got to be real. You know, you go now, and you know, there's a line to get to the trailhead, to get to Is the there? line, to yeah. get to the base of the cliff. But that's that's okay. I mean, yeah. that's the world. Right. We, that's the world that's we live. We we're, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna celebrate the fact that that people are out there and that that, yeah. that people care. Is about Is Davidson it. River down there under there still still good fishing? Davidson's still good rainbow trout fishing. Yeah. Um, it's a it's a lot of fun. You know, it's a it's a place where yeah, you're, it's a little rubbing shoulders yeah. uh, going on there. Yeah. Um, it's a big enough stream that that I, I remember the first time that I trout fished outside of North Carolina. This was years and years ago. Uh, it was some buddies and I decided to go fish the you know the famous spring creeks of Pennsylvania, right? Mm-hmm. So and I like I, the Latort, the Latort, and the yellow breeches, and yeah. And so I was I'd, I'd gone out in the yellow breeches one day and was casting, and uh. 
heard a little rustling behind me, you know, and this guy comes down and, hey, how you doing? Well, he walks up 40 yards and walks out the stream, starts casting. You know, that's just, that ain't right where we came from. Right, sure, <laughs> you, know, sure. you, know, you know, we're we're concerned about the wet boot print on the rock. That's mm-hmm. ruined our our <laughs> our fishing trip for the yeah, day because we're right. not first, uh, and and boy that way that that sort of shared. I mean, I only I only bring that up and that I'm I'm a little more interested in personally in places where there's no wet wet boot prints on the too. rock. Yeah, right. Well, I mean the the difference you you got to you got to roll with both. Yep. Um, in this world, but yeah, for I mean I mean that's why I live where I do. Is is the lack of wet boot prints? Yeah, um, that's and, why I'm coming to see you this summer. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll print I'll, tra- it up. I'll trade you on that in the <laughs> Albuquerque. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, for sure. Yeah. But that, I mean, I mean, there's no doubt, and that's the essence of a kind of backcountry experience. You know, is is to to move beyond where the boot prints are. Exactly. Um, and and be and be savvy and 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 self sufficient enough. To 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 do that well, yeah. you know, do that efficiently and beautifully. And w- but the other thing, thinking thinking of boot prints, one of the one of the saddest answers to a question that I ever had in an interview uh, was I was out with a, a biologist who worked with freshwater mussels, right? And so sure. if there's if there's anyone in the world, any any niche in the in the world that is is going to prime you for depression and sadness, it's a you know it's a small creek biologist. Um, and I asked him what what had changed the most about freshwater creeks in North Carolina. And I was thinking it was going to be water quality. It was going to be this. He looked at me and said, there's no more rope swings mm-hmm. and no more bare children's footprints on the riverbanks. Wow. And, th- and that was sort of soul crushing to yeah. hear that. You know, yeah. he's, he's not talking about dissolved oxygen or pollution. Yeah, he's right. like, there's no more, there's no more people coming out to feast right. on Something that we think is as prosaic as a little Piedmont Creek, right? yeah. And that was that was that was an interesting perspective. Yeah, that's harsh. Yeah, you know when when you think of uh, the the estrangement from the natural world that that too many people are are they're, they're caught in it now. We were we were talking earlier before we got this going. Um, it's. It's about the the breadth of experience, and in a sense, it's about the breadth of your soul, and in, in deeply engaged with a larger system, and with you inside it, which is which is the engagement with the natural world. And when people are losing that, um, you can say you don't care, you know, or, or you're glad they're not out there. I used to right. do, uh, most of my fishing in Tuscaloosa was done on game days, football days. Yeah, because you, you knew. You, yeah, you, yeah, you could, yeah, you could you, get, you know, go anywhere you want. <laughs> yeah, uh, and so, but but the estrangement is is it, there's a, a Tom McGuane, the novelist, once said, you know, we it's no doubt that we live in a declining shrivelization. Shrivelization, and, and you know, on my desk right now is a little quote. By Jim Harrison, I just read his collection, "The Beast That God Forgot to mm-hmm. Invent," mm-hmm. and and it, it says that the the great danger of civilization is that we piss away our lives on nonsense, right? <laughs> right, yeah. right. And when you hear that, and when I when I read that, and when I wrote that down as my little is my little mantra, you know, I was gonna yeah. I was gonna have that be my email signature, but then I thought, well, that's just an example of just freaking nonsense. And so right. I just put it on my desk, and every day right. I try to I really do look at that word nonsense and try to think, where is the nonsense in my life, and root it out, right? Root it out, you know. You bet. Yeah, and I, I think there's a um. I, I want to move to to talking about because this is this is a good segue, is um into writing, you know, and and how you did that because, I guess there's nonsensical writing, but writing is so damn hard that nobody would do it for nothing, you know. I mean, oh, I no, mean, we all do it for nothing yeah, practically but, but, yeah. <laughs> in a material sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's not um, true. I've been very, very fortunate to to. I've been very fortunate to write for publications that still value the written expression of what we're yeah, talking about. For sure. I, I cannot say magazines like Field and Stream and, and Garden Gun and Audubon and they they value what it what it takes to just 
express this. And yeah. so, you know, it's a my, very old school ethic um, it, that uh, especially Field and Stream has on some of your work in particular, where it's very experiential. It's very much a celebrate, a deep celebration of, of of the topic, whatever it might be, whether it's whether it's squirrel hunting or or duck shooting or or people. Um, a piece you did in South Alabama. I remember on the deer camp. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's just a, that was like that 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 thing works on so many levels. I'll flatter you. Uh, it uh, it works on so many levels. It's cultural. It's experiential. It's natural world. It's conservation. Um, it's it's uh, it's it's ethics and it's it's generational, right? With the, with all the, the and uh, with all with the with the father sons daughters. All right. Um and. I mean, a piece like a piece like that is valued still by Field and Stream. There's no doubt, no doubt, and 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 hats off to them for sort of continuing to push me to to try to find those those stories. It's it's sort of evolved into a way of looking at us at a story. I I just love to tell stories, mm-hmm. and they're just they just happen to be told through the lens of of hunting and fishing, right? Uh-huh, but right. but at the heart of it, it's it's got to be a great story, right? I mean, right. The, a beautiful place is not a story. Right. You know? An awesome experience. The worst thing that can happen to me on a magazine assignment, right, is to get there and have beautiful weather and, and tons of whatever it is. Right. Before we fill up the boat and we, you know, yeah. we eat and we drink and, yeah. and then that, that, what have I got then? I got nothing to write about. So, right. I, I I do, and I think when I think about some of the stories that 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 have certainly meant the most to me, and what I think have meant the most to my readers, have been the you 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 come away with the story, right? And it was just it was told around this great communal campfire of shared hunting and fishing experience, but it wasn't a hunting story, right? It was, it was a human story, and those are. They're hard, they're hard to write, but that's what I do. They're hard to find. But yeah. That's that's what I enjoy. What people don't see is the you know, the 40, 50, 60 phone calls behind every story to to ferret out, you know, is this is this something that that's going to be enduring? Right. You know, I mean, a magazine is investing an enormous amount of resources in this story in terms of what they're paying me, what they're yeah. paying a photographer, what, what you think what you think a a full page ad in these magazines cost and you and you've got an eight page feature. Right. So there's a there's a there's sort of a burden to make that to make that count. There and, is. And, and I you can't invest, let that I don't know about you, but you can't let that paralyze you. No, you because can't because in order to be creative you got you you've got to be somewhat uh, relaxed in, in your ability to to fulfill that obligation. Right. Um, right. In, but but you're investing yourself too. I mean, yeah. a, a major narrative feature for these magazines is, you know, a minimum of two straight weeks out of out of my life, right? That that I'm giving to this. And yeah. uh, but having said all that, man, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, and I'm super yeah. happy, super well, happy to be and, here. And and it is not pissing your way uh, your life away on nonsense. I, and and I, I'll give as an example the thing we were talking about earlier. Where that I read that one page essay from Jim Dean in a field and stream held fifteen years ago, and I have never, I have been changed. I never felt the same way about hardly anything again. And it was simply a recollection of them over Christmas going to the outer banks, buying oysters, and being you know beset by a cold front. And their their juxtaposition of the of those raw windy beaches with a with a home mm-hmm, for sure. And yeah. I I yeah. have never gotten over it. And and hearing you say that is is what I hunt as a writer. Yeah, that's that's what uh, that's that's what I quest after. Yeah, are those those moments when it is sort of transformational for yeah. the reader. And, yeah, and I hope I've had a few. Um, I don't know that I've had. I've had that many, but I've I've had enough to where thank old Colin Kearns and Dave Benedetto and Anthony Licata they they keep sending me out there. Right, you bet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and I so and, and briefly we 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 don't have time to to run to to where I'd like to go with it. But what do you, you started out with this long time ago? I mean, 
I don't know what years you started. Is it the nineties? As a writer. Yeah. Yeah. So sadly it was before the nineties. Mm-hmm. Um I graduated from college in eighty three. Uh, was at Chapel Hill the same years as Michael Jordan. He'll make he'll make something of himself one of these days, uh, <laughs> as you have. <laughs> yeah, y'all but, both y'all both got time. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, but I got out of college, degree in journalism, degree in English, and wanted to be a writer. And what what does that mean yeah. now? You Where know? did you go to college? I went to UNC Chapel yeah. Hill. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I just I just started writing on my own. Yeah, I literally. Two college degrees. I worked at a I worked at a drugstore, ringing up people on the cash register, writing in longhand uh, behind the cash register. To what end? Were you trying to sell it? Um, I was trying to get it. Trying out. to figure it out. Well, trying to get it out of my system. Yeah. Trying to figure out. I had learned how to write, you know, in school. Yeah. But but I didn't want to write for newspapers. I, I became infatuated with magazines. Um. Got a little job after I mean I was I mean I was literally a janitor at at the local bank on Franklin Street right there in Chapel Hill. I'd leave my job at Sutton's Drugstore. I'd go clean the clean the bathrooms, and in exchange for that, they didn't pay me, but they gave me a little office. Yeah, uh, on the second floor overlooking Franklin Street, I yeah. could lift up the window and hike my leg out of there. And I, I mean, we talked about this earlier. Yeah. I mean, I felt like I was Hemingway in yeah. in Havana. I mean, it was just it was so rich, and yeah. I was just sort of steeped into this this writer thing. Right. And so, you know, you mentioned Jim Dean, the long time, you know, just uh, revered editor of wildlife in North Carolina. And so one day I just called him up, you know, and said, Hey, I want to be a writer. And I, I just don't have any idea what that means. And this was back in the day when people really, you know, when, when editors had time, I, I just can't, I can't fathom their, their lifestyles now, right? you know, cause they're editors and they're content producers and they're, yeah. they're everything. These yeah. guys, you know, Jim was an editor. He, he said, come over. So we were sitting there talking in his office and uh, and the phone rang, and he picked up he picked up the phone, and and I remember him sort of you know, yes ma'am, you know, no ma'am. He's just you know he was just so cordial, and at one point he 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 said hold on a second, and he handed the phone over to me with a big long black curly cord, and he said this phone this is for you. I'm like you know <laughs> yeah. I'm like what twenty three yeah, and it was the editor of of the Zebulon Record, which is a tiny little tobacco town in eastern North Carolina. They were looking for an outdoor writer to write a once a week column. And baby, I was in Zebulon at eight o'clock the next morning yeah. to the great, great uh, chagrin and, and pain of all of my editors to come. Uh, I wrote an outdoor column at five cents a word. And so I learned, you know, 300 words. I was backing out of the driveway. Yeah. You know, right, uh, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And I know some people that are out there right now going, yeah, we've, we've suffered from, from that. Yeah. And that's where it started. I started freelancing from there. Um, yeah. and, and it was really a matter of not, not knowing what the mistakes were. So I didn't know if I was making mistakes. I just, right. it's what I wanted to do. Once yeah. I figured out that you, that there was a way to make a living writing for magazines back then, um, that's all I. That's all I cared about. Yeah, yeah. And the, did the Zebulon did that work out pretty good? Yeah, you know, I wrote that column for uh, for about a year, and then I I had a I had a wonderful marketing uh, idea. Uh, I walked down the down the street to the Chapel Hill newspaper and asked them if they wanted an outdoor column. So they started running the column, and at that point. I was the a, same column or different? Same same column. Uh-huh. So that meant I was a freaking syndicated right columnist, on. man. I was at the <laughs> I was at the top. I was Look at the top. Yeah, <laughs> the way. That's right. See, yeah, mama, yeah. mama, I said I'd be somebody. Right on. But uh and that and that was awesome. And then I then I had a job for about two years at a little city paper type magazine and started uh freelancing for men's journal. I mm-hmm. uh, was one of the first. Uh-huh. And uh and so I left in the late eighties. Went out on my own as a freelancer, but you know, back then, I mean, it was, it sounds adventurous now and it was adventurous, but I mean, if I made 600 bucks, I was good. You right. Know? Right. And I just built it from there. Men's Journal, Smithsonian, National Trust for Historic Preservation. Um, and then when the two top editors at Men's Journal, Sid Evans and David DiBenedetto, uh, were hired away by Field and Stream. Right. Um, that was my, that was, that was, that was, that was a break. That was yeah, a big. That was yeah. a big break. Yeah, you know? yeah. So that was that was that was awesome. 
And that's where you you started doing like your you were we were talking about your knife stuff earlier, and then and you started doing like outdoor gear techniques tactics. Um, you know, I mean, in, I, a, in addition to those experiential exactly. places, exactly. Yeah. And, here, and here's the reason: and I don't I don't want to sugarcoat it. You know, I I eat what I kill. Right. You know? I've got to make a living as a writer, and that's been a, that's been a very positive thing, and it's and it's been a very it's been a very negative thing. You bet. You know, I, I have never been able to to write unless I mean, none but a fool ever wrote for money, as Samuel Johnson said. And and I was in that position, and a lot of good came out of that, and it was somewhat constraining as well. Sure. But so I've done a ton of how to for sure, you right? Know, or outdoor skills, fishing, hunting, camping. Enough for that book, The Total Outdoorsman, which you know took. Took on an entire life of its own, right? Um, but er- early on, I had an affinity for the, these these sort of culturally relevant stories, right. I guess, and uh, and so I've been very careful to to have have those going on at, at all times because those are the, those are the bigger pieces that yeah they bring me they bring me great joy you right. know the, the, the shorter pieces bring me the great joy of a paycheck and yeah. don't, don't get me wrong right. you know, at, right. some, at, at some point you have to be careful in the in the when you're writing for money right and I'm, i write for money it's my job you know people ask me day after day you know where do you where do you come up with the the drive for this you know and i'll go i've got a box at my house when when i need drive and when i need ideas and when i need discipline i go to my box and i reach in and i pull out the power bill yeah or the mortgage statement it's my idea and discipline box is hanging on my front porch it's, you the, ma- you know, it's the mailbox so yeah so that's been and, and again that's been a good thing because every day i i have to write right and but Every day I write. Every, every day I write. Um, and so that's that's a that's been a wonderful it's been a wonderful life of of rearranging those letters and rearranging those words and I, I mean I can't imagine doing anything different. Yeah, and experientially too, like even even the how to stuff, like like when you're I know you got not you you got stuff on knots. You know I'm a knot freak. Yeah, and um, having come out of the mountaineering and climbing world, and I, I never was a sailor, you know, but I've got like the Ashley Book of Knots. You exactly, know? sure, um, sure. And the stuff like the stuff you've done on that, it's still the the it's it's still experientially. Like, one thing about writing is you, you don't have a lot of money, but experientially, it's it's extraordinary. It is extraordinary, you know. Yeah. And, on, and on the one level, we can kind of joke about it and go, you know, I get to live a lifetime I can't afford, and we do. We get to go to places and access, but. But but what writing about hunting and fishing and camping and, and wilderness travel has, has done for me is it's it's given me what I think a lot of BHA folks share, which is a pride, not a pridefulness, right. but a pride in ability. Yeah. Okay. I can I, I do remember this this one time when when I I shot a doe, um, and it was kind of far back in the woods, you know, and it was going to be a hump and a drag and a cuss and a, you know, and a hurt and a bleed and, and halfway back to the truck, taking a, taking a break, it just, it sort of occurred to me how that I had done all of this. I had, I had found that, that little opening in the thicket where the trail came into this hardwood glade. I had, I had found that I had worked the wind. I had shot that deer. I had gutted it in the woods. I had hauled that thing almost home, and we were going to eat it at my table tonight. And yeah. I put all of that together, and and not a boastfulness, not a pridefulness, but a sense of I I did this. Yep. And that's where that kind of skills yep. stuff comes in. I, I like I like doing stuff. Uh, and yeah. learning and learning stuff, and and then, frankly, I've been super fortunate to be around people who are who are much much better, much more skillful than I. But you know, part of being a writer is sort of leeching off them too. So, uh, well, and 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 also uh, when they're gone, they're gone for good, 
and so you're you're actually performing another service there, which is to which is to bring that information to to the page. Well, I, I, I appreciate the fact that you recognize my life has been one of just nothing but service, but service to the greater right, good. Right. Right. We're gonna, this, is, this, is, this is the beginning of something awesome. The, I'm looking uh, forward the, to it. The paychecks are just a lanyard. <laughs> yeah, you, know, yeah, the, yeah. you know, Louisiana, just a little something extra. <laughs> I like it. Uh, so, um, but one of the things, well, do you have, I, we, you and I had talked about the story um, about the, the hunting accident, really. Yeah. Um, that yeah. I... I kind of uh, I I don't see it as your high water mark, but it's certainly one I remember as your as as one of your more po- uh, just a powerful piece. I won't yeah. even say yours. In a sense, you lose on- you've lost ownership of this story. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because yeah. this this the story that you're talking about is called following our following our father, and boy, that was truly someone else's story. These these two young boys who are now men. They owned that story, and it had laid dormant for 30 years. And, and, and the backstory of this was uh, their, their father had been shot in a hunting accident while they were there out there hunting with him by someone on an on adjacent property. Um, and this had, been, this had been almost 30, 30 years. And so I, I, I found these two brothers, and I found the game warden who had investigated the accident. And I found uh, the man, the older man now, who had who had shot this man accidentally and killed him, uh, who who was who was who was charged but didn't serve time, and it was an accident, and you know just one of those things. Um, and I was hoping we would all get together, but but the shooter, for reasons I completely understand, didn't want to be involved in. This. But we all went back to the to the family farm. And we, we thought may, maybe we could find the tree mm-hmm. where their father was sitting. And we, and we, found, we found the tree. Yeah. And this is 30 years after? This, and, and it was, I mean, it, I mean, it was, just, it was that, that moment was one of the few times as a, as a writer where I, I realized that I had crafted this, that I had put this into, into play. But as, as, those, as those brothers were weeping by that tree, and the and the and the game warden now an old man was sort of off, sort of weeping, and I was I was I was witnessing this, and I it was the, one of the few times I felt like I didn't even deserve to be there. You know, mm-hmm. I didn't know how to I didn't know how to write about a moment that was that was not mine, right? Um, but it it did turn out to be what I think is a was a was a powerful story of of forgiveness and and of journey yeah. that these two young men, now my contemporaries, uh, yeah. and they, and they still hunt and fish with, with great passion. Yeah. Um, it, it was a, it was a powerful moment, yeah. a powerful moment. And, and you rendered it into a powerful document. You know, um, I was, an, and what I think what, what, uh, impressed me about that story too, uh, was just their incredible religious faith. Which which obviously had sustained them uh, through both, both through the tragedy and in, and in, and in, and in other way, aspects of their lives, you absolutely. Know? And um, it's very difficult to uh, to write from outside of of other people's deep religious faith as they're experiencing it right there in front of you. And, right, and and it is true that each of these each of these men had taken different journeys through what what that bullet did mm-hmm. to their faith. Mm-hmm. They had to come to terms with what it did with their father. Uh-huh. Yes. But they also had to come to terms with, with what a moment like that meant for their faith. And, and that was part of the story. You know, you do have to be careful with your treatment with that. Um, and they were, they were gracious in, in giving, giving me the permission to yeah. write that story right. the way I, I mean, it, it was, it was, it was a, an act of, of, uh, of, of strength on their part yeah. to give me that story, you, bet. you know, cause, cause I tell you the first time they read that story was when that magazine hit the shelves, you know, yeah. they didn't know what I was going right. to do with it. So, so that, that was, that was a true, right. a true blessing. That, that was a powerful, I've had a couple of powerful stories that, that I do think have, have gotten to the heart of something. Yeah. 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 Do you have any great favorites? 
deep, shallow, uh, well, easy, hard. Yeah, I mean, I've, and, I mean favorite experiences that, that also turned out okay as stories. Yeah, I mean, I you know people always want to know you know about the close calls and and yeah. and I mean there there there've been a few of those. I you know I think maybe my favorite story. Maybe a story, uh, the story that's meant the most to me. How's that? There's, there's stories yeah, that have yeah, meant more right. than, than, than other people. <laughs> right. uh, I remember I was at the SHOT Show with Colin Kearns, who was my, was my editor at Field and Stream at the time. He's, he's editor-in-chief now. Um, and he asked me how I started hunting and fishing. And this is after I've been riding for Field and Stream, you know, for forever. Yeah. And, I, and I, when I told him the story, we were sitting, I can't remember the bar we were sitting at in, in uh, at Las Vegas. And when I told him the story of how I came to hunting and fishing, he's, he was just sort of, blank staring at me and mm-hmm. and a mixture of a little bit of awe and wonder and and some some anger that you have never written this story, story yeah, uh-huh. for me and so that was a that was a piece called the reunion hunt mm-hmm. um you know it's a it's interesting how because this story helps explain my my current love for for this organization for, okay. for bha cool. I, I think in a in an in an important way. And it's one of those things as a writer, I do sort of sit around a lot and think about some stuff. And I've, I've, I've thought about this. So talking about those non-traditional ways to get into hunting fishing yeah. that we touched on earlier, I, I grew up in a small town in, in, in North Carolina. There was not a hunter. There was not anyone in my family who hunted, right? I don't think I knew of a hunter. I don't think I had ever seen a hunter. In, in my childhood, my, mm-hmm. my family, we camped, talked about this earlier. My dad was a big backpacker back right. when, you know, backpacking wasn't even a thing. Right. We I always, remember you said he had a map of Linville Gorge yeah. that, you, that you still got today. One of the few things yeah. of his I have. Was, yeah. And this was back in the, this was back in the late sixties and early seventies, yeah. you yeah. know? So we had that kind of camping thing going on in the family. My dad was a, my dad was a pilot. He was a small plane pilot and he, he died in a plane crash when I was 13. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you know, it was just one of those movie moments. Walking home from school, there's this long curve in the road to, to sort of reveal the house where we lived in. And I just, I just remember seeing cars and then more cars and then more cars. And so he died when I was 13. Um, and there was another gentleman, a friend of his, a younger fella. Well, I mean, I see this guy. Keith Gleason was his name. Mid twenties, just gotten out of the military. He was a marine, and and he he loved my father, and uh, he came to my mother and said, "I want to take Eddie squirrel hunting. Do you mind if I take Eddie squirrel hunting?" Now, backstory: of This is even though I didn't have a hunter in my family, I, that's all I cared about doing. I mean, mm-hmm. growing up little, it was in the woods. You know, when all the other kids were going to football practice, I was literally in the backyard with my Fred Bear black bear bow sticking airs in pine straw bales while they're yelling derisively, you know, right. nature boy is right, what they call right. it. Nature sure. boys, you know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, that's all I cared about. I had all the field and streams. I mean, I remember, you know, the Northwest, is it the Northwestern School of Taxidermy? That yeah. that, that yeah. little ad but, in the yeah. in the back of yeah. the in the back of the magazine. I did that, you know, stuffing squirrels in the in the living. I wanted to hunt so badly. And there mm. was absolutely no pathway for me uh-huh. 10 11 12 years old I, rem- I remember driving in, in in the family car 1973 ford pinto station wagon blue with the wood beaver stuff i remember I like, it like it was yesterday heck yeah i remember laying back there driving down i-40 going to the mountains and through the window laying back there because there's no seat belts in the window around hickory north carolina there was a there was a giant field that you could see from the interstate and i saw a little pin prick of blaze orange and and truly how i remember thinking to my 11 or 12 year old self will, will i ever get to go hunt well wow. will that ever be a part of my life and sort of the answer was there was no it's just no so when keith gleason and to his great credit he didn't take me hunting the next saturday he took me hunting the next saturday and the saturday after that and the Saturday after that, and from that moment when I was 13 to the day I left for college, when Keith Gleason went to the woods, he took me. Mm-hmm. And it was deer hunting in the Uari National Forest when there were, this was in the early 70s, 
scientifically proven fact there were three deer and 9,000 rattlesnakes. You know, this was when you know, <laughs> yeah. there was no hope. There was no prayer, but we were after it. You know, we were yeah. after it in squirrel yeah. hunting. And so it's, and that just opened up the whole world, right? That's, so I, I went to college and I hunted more and I fished more and I camped more, but you know, we, we're not given, it's a rare thing to have that gift of looking, looking back in your life, how, and, and you put a finger on the trajectory of who you are Bet. and the trail that you trod and it, and at Keith Gleason at that squirrel hunt behind the wise potato chip factory in Winston Salem, North Carolina, my life took a right hand turn and it's that trajectory has never, has never stopped. Yeah. And so, but, but the, but the sad thing or, or the, or the, the embarrassing thing was when I went off to college, after I left the college, I never hunted with Keith again, you know, uh-huh. fall into, I got this crap, you know, we sure. just, so that was the story that Colin and I cooked up in Las Vegas, uh-huh. right? The reunion hunt. You go back with Keith, you and Keith. And here's the cool thing. And I remember Colin saying this, you hunt, you hunt anywhere you want. Y'all want to hunt big deer in Saskatchewan. You want to elk hunt. This is the story we want to tell. You'll go, gotcha. any, you'll go anywhere. Yeah. And when I was talking to Keith about it, we, we knew where we had to go. And we had, we had to go back to the Uari National Forest <laughs> to find those three deer amongst yeah. them 9,000 rattlesnakes. Right. Kicking them out of the way. You know, knowing that we were giving up, really, you know, one of those, as I joke about them, this year's hunt of a lifetime. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. But we went back to the Uaris. We hunted hard. We saw deer. We never connected. And I wrote a story called The Reunion Hunt. That is that is the most the most meaningful to me because it's it's a it's a biography of 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 passion I think uh-huh. you know and I think and so when I look at when I look at where BHA is I'm one of those people for whom access to wild places changed everything about my life yeah. And I'm, I still wake up in the woods astonished that life has worked out this way and a sense of blessing and gratitude. We talked about this as a writer. I still get a thrill from seeing T. Edward Nickens in little black letters mm-hmm. on white paper, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Now, I get a thrill seeing it on the pay to the order of sign on my checks too. Right, sure. But it's nothing like a sense of, of, of blessing. And I, and I, and I do, I mean, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a tough job that we all got tough jobs. We all, right. we, you know, I'm not, there's still a sense of frequent astonishment that life has worked out this way. Yeah. And there's now a sense of gratitude that I think I've figured out a way to, to make a difference. And yeah. this organization is, is a, is a big part of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a powerful take on it. I mean, I got to tell you, I mean, it's like, and, and also to have, I don't know. I, I think there's a lot of people and they're, and they're not going to articulate it the same way, but I think, I think what you're talking about right there is, is a, a, a universal yeah. amongst a lot of people I run into yeah. here. Um, it's been, and it doesn't matter where they're coming from. That's one of the things I, I've been, you know, really happy about is to see the east, the east of the Mississippi people coming into BHA and 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 because they we need well we as a nation need them so badly, you know. And and the South has always been to me. It had to. It was always the wellspring of hunting and fishing passion and. Yeah. And like you said, the people sitting on that five gallon bucket, you know, I always wanted um, them. I'd pitch that story a lot. Yeah. The, the cane pole people of the, the Mississippi Basin. Yeah. Um, and and never nobody ever was as interested in it as I was. <laughs> but but the just the the hunting and fishing power of the southeast. Right. I always wanted it to have an avenue. Yeah. And so I'm going to turn that around because I think BHA needs those people. Yeah, no doubt. You know, we we need to engage 
everyone who loves public land. Right. Everyone, and, and there's, and it, and it is true in the South, particularly where, where land and landscape is history. Yeah, you know, and where our engagement with with land in, informs us in, in so many ways. Um, it it is it is a natural fit, but BHA needs us. Well, they need to tap into that, and that that's why I bring up this paddle strokes mm-hmm. and and foot and foot paths. Yeah. It doesn't matter how far off the road you have to get to get to your back country. Right. What matters is what happens as soon as you're there to your to your soul. Yeah. And what matters is that that no longer remains enough. That's the key. It no longer remains enough for you to respond to back country by being there. You have to do something about it. And that's what we're tapping into. You asked yeah. earlier what it is. It's yeah. that it's no longer enough to cap that ridge and see that elk down there in range. It's no longer enough for some of us you know, to have those ducks come in and it's perfect. What's right. it's, what's a, we, we have to, it's trite to say this, oh, we got to give back. Right. Um, well, I, the quid pro quo kept coming up in my mind when we we're talking about this, though. So. In in in, in, what, re- in what terms? In return for this um this soulful depth that you you experience in whatever your backcountry is, um you do have. I, I'm afraid that you do have to give something back. Um, I mean, in and here's I'll throw you another cliche: ain't yeah. nothing come for free. Nothing right? comes for free. But we're also at a moment in history where we've been able to skate. You yes. know, forties, fifties, sixties. We didn't have to give anything back no, but we to, 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 to conserve the opportunity in the future. It was just going to be there. Yeah. Now, now we know. Now yeah. we know. You if bet. we don't give it back, we're not ever going to get it back. Right. And that's that's the difference. And 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 so it's you know, like I'm a little. You were both. You know, we're a little, a little long in the tooth here, yeah. and it's it's taken us all of these years to come to these conclusions. Yeah. How how awesome is it to walk into that room down there with a in the, in the rendezvous and see these college kids, these 25, these 28, these 35 years old, and they get it. Get it, right. You know? And right. hopefully, Ryder, hopefully folks like you and I, maybe we go to bed at night with a little smile on our face thinking we had a little piece to, of, of the role to, to play in that. Right. But of simply telling the story that's there, you know. I tell people, I can't tell a story, especially when I'm profiling someone, you know. I can't tell a story that's not there. Right. So that's that's sort of the beautiful thing about about what I do is yeah. is I've got to find this the story that's already there. Right. I mean, I, I work the knobs, you know. Sure. I turn up the volume on this and turn yeah, the volume right, down right. on that. But well, there's a beautiful saying in the, um in that uh, I think it's Scorsese's bi- uh, biopic of Bob Dylan. Um, it's called No Direction Home. Okay. You ever seen it? Mm-mm. There's a thing where the poet Allen Ginsberg, who's kind of a silly guy, but he's, he's like a, a great poet. Um, he's like a holy clown, you know? <laughs> It'd be very irritating to hang out yeah. with. I don't think that's on his business card. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> it ought to be. <laughs> but but Ginsberg says of, of Bob Dylan, he said, at his greatest, he said, I had returned, and, and there was this guy who could play guitar and sing Woody Guthrie songs. He said, and then I came back, and he was a column of air channeling something that had always been there. Always been there. From somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. Dig that, huh? We hope. We hope in our line of work, you know, that that our toil takes us. To some edge of that, to you some, know. Uh, yeah. yeah, I was trying to figure out, but you're right, to some... To edge of that fire. If, yeah. you, if you could immerse in that fire, it'd be great. It'd be but great. if you could just touch yeah. the edge yeah. of the embers, right. I'm good, you know. Uh, absolutely. But, but that's what I mean. Those stories are always there. So uh, they, they they exist among us, and you give them, you give them form, right? Mm. And one of the stories, that story for me, has been this public lands thing. And, and, uh, and, and the, the utter unreality, I feel, when in 1999, I read Perk Reports, How and Why to Privatize All Federal Lands Now by Terry L. Anderson of Bozeman, Montana. There you go. And I was living on the edge of the Bitterroot National Forest. I had, uh, let's see, I had I'd killed some elk by then, you know. I had done some huge trips, every bit of it on public land. Yeah. I, I actually 
was planning my, my life with my family around the concept of public land so exactly. that they could enjoy the liberty and, and, and it didn't matter what they hunted or they do hunt, mm. but whether they hunted or fished or not, we were, we had this paradise. It's not paradise freezing cold, right? But you're wandering around. The liberty is paradise. Right. And here I read this report. And so I pitched that to Mike Toth. Yeah. And yeah. we did that story, which came out in 2000 called no place whatsoever. I remember that. And to this day, that's exactly, hell, ain't, ain't, ain't nothing changed except the energy and the power and the money behind the movement yeah. to divest of us of our birthright. Yeah. And and you. What in the heck? I mean, what are we even but, talking about? But that, that's, that's what I mean, the sense of unreality. But that diff, that's the difference is, is I do believe we've, we've started to look at this as our birthright. This is, this is you are taking something from me. Physically, right, taking something from me, and, and you and, may try to take it from me, but you will not take it from my children. Well, we hope, but yeah. we we know it can be yeah. done. You yeah. know, we we know it can it it can be done. So that that's why we fight yeah. to to make sure that it that it's not. And it's funny because that story has been lying around, you know, and and we give it form, and it and it 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 continues to blow my mind when I talk to people that. Or like, well, the Fed should own that land anyway. They still say it to me. And they, I, they, should, they should never have owned that land. You're saying, right. yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I just, um, I mean, we're in a, uh, in a, in a sense, we're soldiers in a war. You know, with, but, the, but with I, the storytelling, we we are. But I, I just don't. There, I think there's a danger in setting it up in such draconian, yeah, terms. I agree. You know, I mean. Well, remember we, we talked about earlier that, that if it ain't a celebration, that it's not. It's 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 just yeah. another thing is bad. And hey, frankly, my, you know, my my skill set or or whatever we want to call it is to to give volume to some of that. Why? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, you know. And and there are other writers whose 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 gift is you know, swinging a sharper sword. And, yeah. you know, sometimes I wish, you know, I had a little bit of that. Maybe sometimes they wish, but, but this, this warring aspect, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm at the point in life where I'm, where I'm a little pissed too, yeah. you know, yeah. we, we talked about this earlier. So, so my son, Jack, you know, I brought him up squirrel hunting and deer hunting. Um, I had duck hunted a whole lot before, but just in that time in my life, I squirrel hunted and deer hunted. So that's what we did. Tromped off to the woods and, you know, but when you're that age, deer hunting with dad is an exercise and, you know, shut up, sit down, you right. know, get your finger out of your nose. Don't move your hands. Right. Don't move your hands. And he put up with this for a long time to his great, to his great credit. When I first took him duck hunting. I remember looking over and he was in that deer hunter frozen mode, you know, mm -hmm. fearful. Mm -hmm. And I remember I, I said, Jack, you know, you know, when you're duck hunting, you can talk, you can talk a little bit, you know, you can kind of, you, you need to scratch, you know. And you, I mean, I saw the bird, I mean, it was literally like this right. burden lifted off of him. Right. Um, and of course now I tell Jack, you know, just because you can talk in a duck blind, right? Right. Doesn't mean you have to talk all the time. <laughs> or dance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But he loved duck hunting so much, and I remember, I remember when I was talking to my wife Julie, and I asked, I had to ask ourselves this question. You and I talked about this yeah. earlier. Am I doing a disservice to my child to help him fall in love and engender this relationship with a passion that could break his heart one day? Duck, right. duck numbers going down, access dwindling away. Am I setting up? my child for a lifetime of disappointment and diminishment. Right. And for someone, I want to say someone like me, but for someone who's had the opportunity and the access and still enjoys that, that, that I do, if for that to be my thought process, right. That's not, that's not the America we want to live in. No, we, we don't want to look at our children and go, I have to tamp down your love for something because somebody else might screw it up for you. Right. And that, that's where we are right now. That's yeah. where we are right now. And so it's being here this weekend, but it's not just this weekend, but just being in this whole BHA movement. Land Tawny talks about it as a movement, and it's 
but it but it it's it's a different frame of reference mm-hmm. of 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 what's at stake and and frankly we can win this uh, we wouldn't right. be we wouldn't be doing this if we didn't think that we can win this right and we can't win it all and we can't win every battle but we've we've got the energy and the smarts and the vitality and we are we are on the right side right and and we can we can make a difference yeah. we we can we can do more than make a difference i don't want to make a little difference yeah we don't want to make a little difference well a little difference is it is better than nothing but it's not sufficient to the task it's at this not time. sufficient to the task and so yeah. we have to fight all the little battles that's the wonderful thing about the chapter network you know we've got to put out all the little fires yeah but We've all got skin in the game to think, to think big about this, to think, to think in expansive ways about what, what backcountry is. Right. And, and what, what we're going to do. I mean, look, a hundred years from now, we still got to have places. Yeah. We, our grandchildren still have to have places that they can get as lost in themselves as as we have. That's, we been, have. that's been my, that's been one of the biggest fears. And every generation is a generation of diminishment. You, know, you and I have been, have been in places at times when we think, gosh, this is the greatest thing. Nothing's ever been like this. Yeah. You know, with Jim Bridger would have laughed, would have laughed Absolutely. his butt off. At right. us. So, right. so we've got a, that's what we don't want is this unfolding generation after generation after generation of diminished expectation. Right. You know, so, and I'd, I'd tie that in to, to uh, uh, America itself, you know. Um, we're, we're being faced now with, with a lot of, like, dem- demoralization on, on, our, or on our own institutions, you know, and a, and a kind of a general, like, kind of uh, lack of respect for the institutions that gave us exactly what, what we are we're the beneficiaries of, you know. And um, I, would, I would say, you know, that... This to, so to, if there's a movement, as Land talks about, the movement is to, is to stop dimin- the diminishment of expectation, and that goes to the diminishment of expectation of our political process as well. Because, yeah, they're, because they're, they're, hand, they're, hand they're hand in hand with and um, and we're starting to understand that the political process that's the battlefield that we've got to win this on. I mean, right. we we need to be aspirational and we need to be inspirational and we need to, you know, we need to help people with have their heart sore when in the back country, blah, 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 blah. We got to have something to fight for. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's, it, this is, this is going to be fought and won, you know, in, in legal terms on paper signed off by someone that we elected. Right. Um, and, and that's, that's a little bit of a daunting, a daunting task. It Cause, is cause, a, cause yeah. the people that are in this movement, the la- look, the last place we want to be is in, an elected official's office during right. turkey season, right? You know? With the fluorescent lights <laughs> yeah. overhead shining yeah. on you. Yeah. yeah, this we we didn't. None of us signed up for this, right? You know what I'm saying, right? We were dragged here, kicking and screaming. Yeah, yeah. And with, the, with the prospect of that diminishment yeah. before you, yeah, 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 that you just can't accept. Just can't accept. Yeah, and I, I guess if there's a um, if there's a bright spot in here to me. I don't know if I tend to lean conservative, but I I would probably be described that way, you know, is that um, if there is uh, the word I think that came up today was ding battery. Ding battery. No, yeah. I mean, that's an outer that's an outer banks term. Is you, it, know, you know, this? no. So, hell no. so yeah. So you you go to Harker's Island, right? And a ding batter, an ochre coke, a ding batter, someone who's from off they don't even say from off the island like the island is their whole world <laughs> he's, uh, he's from off he's a ding batter so right a ding on. batter is someone who is outside the tradition yeah right yeah, yeah. that's awesome yeah, man yeah. That's so if, cool. there's, if there's ding battery at at the federal level then you operate at the state level and you and you create you create great you know uh coalitions at the, that, that operate I'm, I'm i'm ready for local I'm yeah. ready for local power, and that where where with good people, right. the anti ding battery, yeah, um, prevails. You know, yeah. and, um, we're, and we're seeing that you know with with other policies. You know, where where the federal government is just throwing in the towel, right? You know, and the states are stepping up and going, 
you're not the only entity that right. can do the right thing. And, and they have not yet. They they have been real utterly remiss in most of their responsibilities that they would love to claim under the Tenth Amendment, you know, and they just didn't do it. All and right. in their abdication, the Fed, the federal government has done it. And now we, I think, I think in our more recent life, um, we've seen not, I don't mean just right now. I mean, the last 15, 20 years, right, right. we've seen a sort of, you know, a throwing in the towel at the federal level. And so we're, we're now forced to be at the state level who we said we wanted to be anyway. Could, so that could, that could actually be uh, a positive thing. Yeah. And it's certainly a positive thing in terms of empowering a movement. Right. Because, you know, you were, we're acting local. Right. You know, and I mean, everything now is sort of, you know, going, you know, act, act local. So I, I think that's sort of a positive. I do too. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. cause it's pretty darn easy to get disillusioned. You know, you got to fight, you got to fight the urge to throw the towel in a lot in this, in this line of work or in, or in this line of, you know, the sort of the conservation industry. Right. So, so finding the battles we can win is always a pretty good strategy. Can't be your whole strategy. Right. You got to play the long game and the big game. But yeah, there's nothing wrong with sending in the cavalry uh, you know, to to take out the the, the skirmishers. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I just and, and I saw it as um I, I, years ago I I I was at a very low place during some of the energy development stuff I witnessed around the west. I can imagine. Because we were not asking for accountability on public land. I, and I, I was I was amazed at some of the um, mendacity mm-hmm. of some of our public officials who were actually supposed to be in charge, and I was um, disillusioned by that. And I wrote a piece called "What Do You Really Believe In?" And it seemed to me that we had talked the talk about loving hunting and fishing and mule deer and and uh, you know pronghorn migrations and and all this stuff, and yet nobody was actually objecting to these obvious assaults. Assaults. Assault. And that's, all, and that's, that's what they were. Yeah, and yeah. um, and that that went from New Mexico, uh, you know, so San Juan Basin clear through through uh, Powder River, and then and then on into Canada. And uh, so the response to that was extraordinarily disappointing. It it seemed to me that we did not believe in what we what we claimed to be so passionate about. And you now all I had to I, I won't say all I had to wait. Right. A few years, and then you walk into that room with all those young people. When I walked into Denver at BHA, mm-hmm. and they 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 were they were answering that question. All right, and they were they were stepping into the breach. They were stepping that, into the breach. That's what we had. We had we yep. had a. I think we did have, frankly, a, a bit of a generational breach. I mean, we you know we revere Roosevelt. Yep. Right. But he he fought like a freaking. Tiger yep. about these issues his entire life, and, that, and that's where it comes back to that complacency. And I, you know, like I'm, I'm pointing the finger at myself. Yep. I, I think we did have. I'm hopeful. I'm. I am so hopeful that we are emerging out of a generation or two or three of complacency right. within the hunting and fishing and and camping and sort of wilderness. Worlds. I mean, we we had giants. Don't don't get me wrong. We we stand on the shoulders of we, absolute giants. But and we stand there and in, in, in utter luxury. That's, utter luxury. That was the complacency. Right. Is we but, had so many successes. But but instead of standing on the shoulders of these giants, now we have. It's wonderful to see an an army. It's infantry. You yeah, know, a new giant. It's of 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 new. People who who are who understand this, and yeah. so to me, that's that's the difference. We've got this this long term historical philosophical underpinning, you know, Leopold, blah 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 blah. Those those are the those are the giants. What they didn't have back then, I don't think, was the foot soldiers that we're seeing yep. at rendezvous at Pike Night at Hunt a Height. That's that's different. Yeah, it's exciting. It's Frankly, selfishly fun. Yeah, when has right. conservation activism been fun? Right. I'll tell you, right. never, <laughs> never <laughs> until yeah. now. Right, yeah. and so that's where it's all coming from. So yeah. I don't want to diminish the role of of those of those giants, but it's it's powerful to see 
to use a term you will appreciate, the tide is rolling. Yeah. <laughs> rolled as yeah. rolled as tide. Yeah, yeah, I got you, man. Yeah. Well, you got anything else you want to throw in the mix? I was going to talk to you about books and influence and all that, but we'll do that next time. Well, I'll look forward. I'll look forward to that next time. I'm just thrilled. Yeah, you know, this was this was my first rendezvous. Mm-hmm. Um, and I I hope Lynn doesn't and the board doesn't mind me me sharing this. Uh, but the question was asked directly of me. Uh, a, a, a new, a new, relatively new board member, um, first rendezvous. What did I think of what we were being tasked with as a board of this national organization? Mm-hmm. What, how did I care? How could I succinctly characterize what our job was? And, and the answer was. It, it feels like, boy, this thing is so congratulatory for the organization. It feels like we are controlling awesome right now. I mean, look, huh? mm-hmm. organizationally, we're on such a trajectory, you know, and, right. we, and we're going to make mistakes. We've made mistakes, and we're going to, and we're going to continue, but it it's, it's just feels good. It, yeah. this org- it just feels good because we see that we can do good good things about the things we most we, we care most about um so organizationally i think we've got to we've got to feed that fire right but but in a way that doesn't that doesn't burn out our chapters it doesn't burn out our staff we're kind of getting into the mundane stuff some of the stuff we were talking about but that that was that was that was my takeaway when when has conservation been fun right when has it been fun right. who came up with this right Conservation, activism, advocacy, raising money, raising awareness, raising the temperature. Guess what? You're going to give up your weekends. You're going to give up your kids' ball games Mm -hmm. because this is fun. Right. Who, who, (laughs) as we like to say down south, who would have thunk it? Who would have thunk it, man? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, man, I really appreciate it, Eddie. I've had a good time with this. Yeah. What what's fun is to be neighbors on the page for so long, Hal. You know, yeah. And we knew we were, we knew we were blood kin. Yeah, we had to have some in common for a long time. <laughs> yeah, man. So this is this has been awesome. I'm, yeah, I'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to you soiling your pants when that first false albacore rips you out. <laughs> <laughs> I also need to come down here and do some hog hunting in pants soiling. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You gotta, you definitely gotta bring a, the fresh, the bring the fresh undies. Yeah, man. Every now and then. <laughs> well, hell, I'll, I'll see you here, man. Let's go get a beer. Hey, this is Hal Herring, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers Podcast and Blast, and I'm signing off. I just want to thank everybody for coming here and listening. We got a huge listenership right now, and I'm super proud of that. I'm, I've, uh, I've had a blast with this, and I hope, I hope people listen to it are having a good time with it too. Go over to Backcountry Hunters and Anglers website, which is backcountryhunters.org, um, and look for the backlog. We got 30 other podcasts out there, and I'm out looking for more right now. Talk soon. <laughs>